We make disciples. What does a disciple look like at Boulder Mountain? It takes time. It's friendships. It's relationships. It's based on God's word. The source of our truth here at Boulder Mountain, the source of our small groups, the source of our teaching, the source of our programs is the foundation of God's word. We want to help our students. We want to help our kids know God's word. Give me the wisdom to know what to do. Where does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from God's word. And then courage to do what God's told me to do. Wisdom and courage working together. Matthew 28 gives us our mission as a church. So we're just going to spend a few minutes looking at that, and then we'll move toward baptisms. It's a really clear mission. Every church, every church in the world has one mission statement. Every church words it a little bit differently. But here is the mission statement. And it is a good reminder we should come back to this at least annually, if not many times throughout the year. Go, in Greek, it's actually as you go. We're all going to go today. After service, we're all going to go. Some are going right now as I speak. (laughs) If if every sermon was that clear. Uh, Our students are heading to children's church. Our our kids are. uh, Go, therefore, as you go. This is what you're to do as you go. Make disciples of all nations. What is a disciple? In its simplest form, it's a follower. It's a follower of Jesus. Make disciples, make students of Jesus, not just a student academic. This is not about information. It includes information. But then you take that information and then it turns into action. As you go, church, as you go, followers of Jesus, make disciples of all nations. Where do we do this? Everywhere. Wherever you are, that's included in here, of all nations. That includes East Mesa, Northeast Mesa, Gilbert, Chandler, Apache Junction, of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, Jesus says, I'm not going to send you without going with you. I am with you to the end of the age. This is the mission of Boulder Mountain Community Church. Specifically at Boulder Mountain Community Church, we make disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. There are some of you who've been following Jesus for decades or others of you who have just started following Jesus. You just came into a personal relationship with Jesus. We make disciples. Making disciples takes time. We live in an instant society, instant culture. Everything is at this two-week class, six-week class, eight-week class. No, making a disciple is lifelong and it is messy Jesus' ministry spent 30 years. Jesus spends 30 years preparing for three years of ministry. Paul comes to meet Jesus. And I remember as a kid, I grew up in church, and the back of my Bible had all these cool maps. I love maps. I love geography. And so I would trace all these maps. His, before he takes his first missionary journey, it's 14 years He doesn't meet Jesus and then go get on a boat and start going on mission trips. 14 years of preparation and study and prayer. We make disciples. What does a disciple look like at Boulder Mountain? It takes time. It's friendships. It's relationships. It's based on God's word. The source of our truth here at Boulder Mountain source of our small groups, the source of our teaching, the source of our programs is the foundation of God's word. We want to help our students. We want to help our kids know God's word. Give me the wisdom to know what to do. Where does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from God's word. And then courage to do what God's told me to do. Wisdom and courage working together teaching them. In this passage, verse 19 and 20, I've had some conversations in small groups about this. It's the most important word. There's a lot of important words in these couple verses. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. It's the most important word in that. There's a lot of important words, so there's no wrong answer here because whatever word you choose is 
is in the Bible, so it's good. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize the word them. Them. Who's them? Them is not us. If you know Jesus, them is not you. You know Jesus, your eternity is secure. Praise God. There's a whole lot of them who aren't here, who don't know Jesus. They've heard things about Jesus. They've driven by a lot of churches, but they've never heard good news. So baptizing them, who's the them in your life? That's where we're going as a church. Every day I wake up, I I have one person I automatically think about pretty naturally. Do you know who that is? It's me. Nobody needs to tell Kyle what I like, what my preferences are, what, what I prefer and want. And I think about me all day long. I'm pretty good about thinking about me. A lot of churches are the same way. We do a pretty good job thinking about us, what programs we want, what messages we want, oh, what songs we like. Am I getting personal now? Them. We, we have a lot of preferences corporately here today. And that's okay. But who we need to think about intentionally every, every week, ministry leaders, you're thinking about this all the time. Who's not here? Who are my family members who don't know Jesus? Who is my neighbor who doesn't know Jesus? Who, who lives on my block? Who lives, who do I work with who does not know Jesus? As you go. This is not in the context of in this building. It's, I like a lot of you, most of you. Yeah, I love all of you. And I love having conversations with you. But what I need to be reminded of on a daily basis are the people who are not here. The people who wake up every day hopeless. The people who are walking through the most difficult things in life, grief, death, and addictions, and they have no hope. The local church is the plan to reach them. Jesus says, I'm going to leave. And when I leave, I'm going to give you a helper. The helper is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, as the church gets started, is the way them are going to be reached. And it is our intention, it is our plan to reach them. One of the early disciples, one of the first disciples of Jesus was a man named Saul. Saul comes as a Jew, and he persecuted Christians, anti-Christian. He was out, he was mocking God, mocking Christ. He was out to persecute Christians. You see that in Acts, early chapters of Acts. He's there at the very first martyr. He, He participated in killing Stephen. A few chapters later in Acts chapter 9, Saul comes to meet Jesus face to face. On the road to Damascus, the Damascus road on the road to Antioch. Antioch is the capital of Galatia. Galatia is the area. It's Roman province. 13 major Roman provinces. Many of these provinces were built to be mini Romes. Seven villages within Rome all built on hillsides. Antioch was built that very same way. Paul, Saul, comes to meet Jesus. Many people believe that he changed his name or God told him to change his name when he met Jesus. But actually, when you read scripture, you don't see his name changed immediately. It's not until several chapters later, 14 years at least before he goes on his first missionary journey. And where does that first missionary journey take him? Through Antioch to the island. He leaves Antioch, he goes to Cyprus. And that's where he has his first first, he leads his first person to Christ. 14 years. Some of us have been praying for family members and friends, maybe people we know who don't know Jesus, maybe parents in the room. You've been praying for somebody and they haven't come to faith in your timeline. 14 years. 14 years. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. It took him 14 years before he had his first convert. Who's his first convert? 
is a man named Sergius Paulus. He's a pro-council of the Roman government. He's high up. He meets him, and at the time that he meets him, Sergius Paulus in Acts chapter 13, he's also, there's a magician there, and they're both competing for the soul of Sergius Paulus. Paul is pointing him to Jesus, and this magician, Bar Jesus, is pointing him in a different direction. Isn't that true? Every person, every person is being competed for by ideas of, of culture, depending on whichever way the wind is blowing. As Paul's first convert is Sergius Paulus, comes to know Jesus. I believe that when Sergius Paulus gives his life to Christ, I think it, it created something within Paul that said, the rest of my life I'm going to give myself, I'm going to dedicate myself to reach as many people for Jesus as possible. And so over the next 13 years, okay, again, 13 years, he plants 14 churches. Church planning is hard work. You might know friends, you may, you, some of you might have been a part of a church plant. It's difficult work. He plants 14 churches as he, as he travels about. All started from reaching one person, Sergius Paulus. Now, here's why did he change his name? There's nowhere in scripture that God says, now you will be Paul. I call you Paul now. Saul, Paul loved his Jewish background. It's just Saul, Saulus, Saul. It was a Jewish name. He loved that. He didn't want to get rid of that. But then also having the name Paul allowed him to speak and go to places and have conversations in Roman meetings and Roman conversations. What's Paul doing here? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, I am willing to become all things to all people. If, if it is needed for my name to be Saul, I'll be Saul. If it's to be Paul, Paul, Saul, he does. He says, I will do whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus. Boulder Mountain, that would be my challenge to us as a church, that we'd be doing anything and everything, short of sin, anything and everything to reach people for Jesus. What does that look like in your life? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up in order so that them might come to know Jesus? Paul's the first church planner. Where's Boulder Mountain Community Church going? I just want to share a few things with you, four things with you, where I believe God is taking us over the next three years. You're like, three years? That's a long time. This is vision. What is vision? Vision is your mission statement with a deadline. What is our mission statement? We make disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. We're going to do that as long as we're here. We're going to do that. But then the vision are here are a few specific things. This is how this is going to look over the course of the next three years. It's 2024, 2027. You're like, 2027, that seems so long ago. Remember when we thought that about 2024? Over the next three years. We're going to baptize 150 people by God's grace. Because here, here's what I know to be true. If we don't have a plan, and you know this is in your own life, if you don't have a plan, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. By God's grace. Is it about 150 people? No, it's about the one. It's about the one person. It's about your family member. It's about your friend. It's about your coworker, who one day in the next three years is going to be in this tank by God's grace. Now, we don't control the results. Our job is to be faithful. I'm going to ask you today, later in service, to write down one name of a family member, a friend, coworker, one person. And they don't have to live here in Mesa. They could be anywhere. But you're going to write down that one name, and you're going to commit to praying for that person to come to know faith, to come to know Jesus. Next three years, we're praying for 150 people to be baptized at Boulder Mountain Community Church. You're like, whoa, isn't that like double our attendance? Yeah. God's pretty big. I didn't want to say five because we have a big God. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to trust him with the results on that. That's not on you. That's not on me. We're going to trust God with the results on that. So that's number one. Number two, we're going to plant a church. You're like, whoa, we're going to plant a church. Yeah. I don't know where. I don't know with who. I don't know who that is. But I believe that there are some people already here that might be a part of a core group of people who are going to go plant a church. 
You're like, don't we have enough churches? There are churches, as I said last week, that are dying, closing their doors every day here in America. Did you know that east of Ironwood, there's going to be 10,000 new homes being built over the course of the next couple of years? How many of them don't know Jesus? My prayer is that there would be a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching pre church that can reach, help reach them. So we're going to plant a church. I don't, maybe, maybe you're a part of that. We're going to develop a core team. The third thing, uh, over the number of years that I've been a pastor, I've had to hire a lot of different staff, different positions, and here's, well, here's what's happening. Uh, if you're not aware of this is happening, here's what's happening. Also, churches are closing their doors, but on top of that, seminaries are closing their doors all across America. They're no longer the schools and institutions that, that exist to raise women and men up for the sake of ministry. And the pool of hiring pastoral staff is really, really shallow right now. And I would love to be a part here at Boulder Mountain to be part to have a training ground. I don't know specifically what that looks like, a school of theology, a training ground where we can identify young men and young women who say, yes, I want to go into vocational ministry, that we would equip them for ministry. I want to be a church committed to anybody in the church that says, I feel like God is calling me to go, that we would support them. Anywhere, anytime. They feel like God's calling you to go somewhere on the mission field. God's calling you to go into to ministry. We want to be part of that. We want to have a, a school here, a training, a residency program. There'll be more specifics of what that looks like, but that's, that's, the third, that's the third thing. The fourth piece, this is number four, if you're taking notes, number four, that we would have a new facility to do some of what God's calling us to do, a, a new facility. The facilities that we've had here have, have served us for 40 years if you're a guest with us or maybe you're, you've started attending here recently, there's a house uh, just directly south of us here. That house was donated when the church got started. And we have configured that house in every possible way to do what we need done to reach kids. Right now it's a children's ministry building. But that will not last long. Uh, this room has served us well. We've gone to, we went to two services last year. We'll go to two services next week. If you come August 4th, we'll have a 9 o'clock and a 10.30 a.m. service. But the time to plan for a new building is not when you need the new building. It's years before, right? And so we are working with an architect currently. We hope later this year to be able to bring some blueprints to you. There's some wise leaders in this church years ago bought the land next door. There's another two acres. When you come down on McClellan and you head east, you see a cross. That's the beginning of the land, the lot that we own there. And by God's grace, there'd be a facility over there. Is this to go bigger? No, this is not to be a massive church. That's not the intention. We're moving from a sedan to a minivan. <laughs> and then one day we'll go to two cars. And that second car is going to be our church plant. Our goal here is not to be a, a mega church, if you will. This is not our plan. It's not a big building. Number one, the neighborhood, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't make sense to have a massive building in this neighborhood, a dead-end road, right? But there are some things that we need to, to do. There's, things have changed. My guess is in your home over the last 40 years, you've upgraded a few things in your home. Because things 40 years ago don't really work today when it comes to technology and check-in stations and Wi-Fi and internet access for, for reaching kids and students. So the thought is that we would bring those blueprints to you later this year, and then we'd see what God, God wants to do. This is our commitment to reach Northeast Mesa with the gospel, to reach them, to have a plan to reach them by God's grace. We'll church plant, we'll baptize 150 people, we'll have a new facility, and we'll be training men and women for the ministry. That's our prayer. But with God's help, you're going to trust him with the results on that. And I'm going to ask that you would play a part in that. Serving, volunteering, giving of your time and your talents, and you would just ask God, God, what does that look like for me to be a part of that? I'm giving you 
a sneak peek of what's to come later this fall. But, but now you know. If we, don't, if we don't have a plan, if we don't have a plan, we're going we're gonna to serve ourselves. We're going to think about us all the time until we die as a church. That's what's happening all around our country. 18 months ago, I was hired, brought in, and the board was really, really clear. Kyle, we're hiring you. Your job is to help us turn outside and reach the city. And I'm so grateful that they gave me that task and that challenge. The easy job is to be insider-focused and, and do what we want, right? And so if some of you, I, and I just want to say I thank you for your grace because the last year and a half have been a lot of changes. And I know it and I feel it. And I wasn't even here for decades, right? I remember one conversation, it was about six months after I was here. There was a, an older woman, so sweet. She came up to me and she said, oh, young man, I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> Every week I show up, there's something different. I'm like, oh boy, here it comes, right? She's going to give me the long list of things that have changed over, over the last few months. And then she leaned and she said, but I like it. I so appreciate that attitude, yeah. So I don't, I don't think she liked everything. But what she's saying, if this is going to reach the next generation, if that's what it takes, if the songs are going to change a little bit, if that's what it takes to reach my grandchildren, then so be it. I'll be a, I'll be a part of that. I'm going to ask you the same thing, that would you be willing to commit there's going to be some changes, more changes. Like, well, more changes. Yeah, there'll be changes. As soon as we stop changing, right, that's when we're going to get status quo and we're going to get stagnant. The mission of the church should never stand still. It should never stop. The Olympics launched this past week. You've heard some discussions and you've seen that the news a hundred years ago, 1924, there was a, a man who won a gold medal for England. It was in Paris, 1924, the Paris Olympics. His name was Eric Lydell. He was actually the first person born in China to ever win a medal, was a missionary. And he won a gold medal in track. And immediately after the Olympics, there's a whole book called Chariots of Fire and a movie you can further context if you want to look into that. But what impresses me the most about Eric Lydell in his testimony is after the Olympics, he goes back to the mission field in China where he was raised, where his parents, why, why did he go there? Because Matthew 28 says, as you go, go and make disciples of all nations. So he goes back to China and he teaches in a, in a school until the Japanese invade his territory and he's put into an internment prison camp where he dies at the age of 45. He gave his life, an gold, Olympic gold medalist. At the end of his life, the reward that he got was not a gold medal. That was not the most precious possession that Eric had at the moment. It was, a, it was the possession that Jesus gave him, the inheritance that Jesus gave him. His rewards were great in heaven. He died at age 45, World War II prison camp. What's God calling you to do? It may not be to go to China. But what does it look like for you to reach them in your community? At the end of service, I think in your programs today, there's paper clipped, a couple name tags. I'm just going to invite you to pull out one of those. If you have two, great. Who's the one in your life? Who's the Sergius Paulus in your life? Here's what I want for you as your pastor. I want you to experience baptizing a friend or family member in this tank. I want that for you. I want you to experience the joy, having the, the boldness and the confidence to have coffee with a friend. Hey, can I tell you about what's most important in my life? Hey, I've known you for a number of years. I want to share my faith with you. I want to share the hope that I have with you. I want you to experience that. 
And then you trust God with the results. What are you going to do with that name tag? You're going to write a name on that tag. That name might be, you might not write the name. You might simply say son or daughter or mom or dad or barista or barber, whoever that is. Maybe it's a name. You don't need to put their last name. Just put their first name. You know who that person is. And you would, there's two there. You would keep one of those. You put that in your Bible. You put that somewhere you're going to see it. And you pray for them every day. You pray for them. It is not on you to save them. We trust God with that. God does the saving. Our job is to be faithful, to pray for them. It might be a classmate at school. It might be somebody at the dog park. That's who it is for me. Who is it? Who is it for you? There's a new uh, artist. My daughter introduced me to this person. A couple of you, have, we've t- had conversations about this individual. His name is Josiah Queen. You're looking for a new artist? Put this in your Apple Music or Spotify, Josiah Queen. He has a song. Here are the lyrics I want to share with you before we move into baptism. On the crowded streets, all the people that I see, I want them to know that Jesus, the Jesus that I know. If I'm the closest thing to a Bible that they read, let the words they read be what you wrote. Father, help me to go. I'll be a garden in Manhattan. That's the name of the song, a garden in Manhattan. I'll be a river where it's dry. We know about that, right? When my friends can't find the road, I'll be a roadside welcome sign. I'll be sunshine in Seattle, be a cool breeze in July. I'll be a light in the darkness. I'll be a garden, a garden in Manhattan. Powerful lyrics, Josiah Queen, a garden in Manhattan. Church, what's God calling us to be? Be a flower in the concrete. Be a garden in Manhattan. To be a river in the desert to be a cool breeze in July. Your friends, your family members are looking for hope. You have it. I just want to make make one final note. My prayer, my goal is not that they come to know Jesus at Boulder Mountain. My prayer in my heart is they come to know Jesus. If that's a church down the street, if that's another church on Ellsworth, if that's another Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church, I will praise God just as much as, as it would be if it was here. All right, we are on the same team with every other Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church in the area. There are a lot of people who don't know Jesus. And I am so excited to go on this journey with you over the next three years to see what God might want to do here in Northeast Mesa. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment. And let us know and and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.